Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your president, Lawrence Wald. Wow, what a week. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for this wonderful, dynamic meeting. It's been an exhilarating whirlwind of activity, I'm sure you'll agree. And uh, we'll all take home our personal highlights, and I hope everyone has experienced a few educational sessions that really informed and challenged them, a few scientific or clinical sessions that connected some dots and fostered some new ideas, and a few person-to-person -person interactions that created new contacts or strengthened uh, old ones. I really hope everyone had a genuinely, uh, some genuinely fun moments. So a remarkable meeting like this has more moving parts than a Swiss watch. And before we enter the final named lecture, the Mansfield Lecture by uh, Professor Kuhl, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank the, the really hard work of the Annual Meeting Program Committee, the AMPC, and the AMPC Chair, uh, Dr. John Port. So let's give them all a hand. So they accomplished a, a really Herculean task. This is, it's hard to overstate uh, the blood, sweat, and tears that go into a successful meeting like this. And uh, let's, uh, we, we're definitely indebted to you, John, for just a wonderful meeting and a wonderful memory of a week in uh, Montreal. And uh, now I, I turn the podium over to John uh, to both sum up a few uh, facts about the meeting and then, of course, introduce our Mansfield lecture. John. All right. Thank you, Larry. And uh, a warm felt on behalf of the uh, Annual Meeting Planning Committee, my co-chairs, uh, Doug Knoll and Nicole Cyberlick, the front office, and uh, all of you, a really warm thank you to all of you for coming to Montreal. Uh, this has been, as uh, uh, Larry uh, suggested, a meeting of numbers. Uh, and just for fun facts, I thought I'd share a couple of them with you. Um, this was the fifth largest ISMRM meeting ever. We had 5,645 registrants at the meeting. Uh, the previous Montreal meeting here in 2011 had about 40 more people, so we're exactly where we were uh, in 2011, which is wonderful. Um, together, you, all of us, submitted 6,016 scientific abstracts of which the annual meeting planning uh, committee and a weekend came together and they put together uh, 74 oral sessions, 29 power pitch sessions, 13 combined educational and scientific sessions, 77 digital poster sessions. We used 85% uh, of those abstracts, that's our acceptance rate, uh, to create the meeting that you all got to uh, walk through this week. So um, Doug Knoll did a great job. We had uh, 84 educational sessions as well with over 350 lectures. So, um, you, the membership, also put together 24 spectacular member-initiated symposia, and these are ideas that you put forth and execute so that we can all enjoy. So I want to thank you for all the hard work that you've done. And with that being said, uh, I have the great privilege of introducing this year's Mansfield Lecturer. Uh, and the Mansfield is one of the uh, three most prestigious lectures we have in the ISMRM, uh, and this one it will be more forward-looking uh, in contrast to Dr. Van Zyl's Lauterbur, which was more uh, historical in nature. Uh, it is my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Christiane Kuhl. Uh, she earned her MD and doctorate degrees from the Uni University of Bonn, uh, incidentally studying a topic near and dear to my heart. She did some phosphorus MR spectroscopy, which is what I'm doing now these days. Uh, Dr. Kuhl currently works in the Department of Diagnostic and Interventional Radiology at the University Hospital in Aachen. Uh, and has, major, has made major contributions in our field, over 200 publications in a wide range of topics, uh, such as dynamic contrast enhanced breast MR, I think we'll hear a little bit about that tonight, uh, interventional oncology. Uh, also, she is an ISMRM gold medal winner and has served on innumerable ISMRM committees over the years. So it is my honor and privilege to invite you to come for the Mansfield Lecture. Thank you. Yeah. So first of all, um, thank you all for having me here. Um, thanks. My thanks goes to the society. Um, it's a, a 
a huge honor for me um, to give the Mansfield Lecture in this year. Um, the title is Predict Then Act, and it is about preventive medicine. Um, preventive, predictive, and prognostic are terms that sound diffuse and are used interchangeable, inter interchangeably um, about as interchangeable as this diffuse illustration here that frequently enough accompanies um, uh, lectures or chapters on precision medicine. So I would like to start um, with some simple definitions to be somewhat more precise about precision medicine. <laughs> Prediction means to know something about a patient or a healthy individual. We would like to foretell who will develop disease and also foretell who will benefit from a given treatment, where a treatment works and in which patient a treatment will fail. That is prediction. Prognostication is to know something about its disease, know about its aggressiveness, its outcome, its need for treatment, so to speak. Prevention is something that we do or where we want to invest. It can be primary prevention. Primary prevention means that we try to avoid a disease to develop, like not smoking in order not to develop lung cancer. And then secondary prevention, where we don't avoid a disease to develop, but where we avoid an existing disease to do harm. And that, for instance, is screening. It, um, you all will probably be very well aware of the fact that cardiovascular disease and cancer are the two major global healthcare challenges in the Western world. What may be less well known is the fact that over the past decades, there has been a steep decline of deaths due to cardiovascular disease, whereas for men as well as women, death due to cancer has stagnated, has not changed a lot, has not decreased to a substantial degree. For women, the most frequent cancer is breast cancer and is second only to lung cancer regarding a, a reason for cancer death. In Germany, my country, it is also the most frequent cause of cancer death in women. We have, over the past decade, seen a progressive increase of cancer incidence and only a mild decrease of mortality rates. So the question that we have is, what can we do to reduce breast cancer mortality? Well, if we go back to the definitions, this is what we ask for. What can we do about breast cancer mortality? Can we avoid risk factors? Well, if you look at the risk factors for breast cancer, it's age, family history, the number of individuals who have breast cancer or ovarian cancer, and the age of onset, prior breast biopsies, hormonal stimulation, age at menarche, age at menopause, dense breast tissue, and then genomic features. You can't change any of them. You can't even influence any of them. So primary prevention of breast cancer is actually not possible. There are no relevant risk modulating effects due to lifestyle modifications. The only tools for primary prevention of breast cancer that we have that are effective are quite invasive measures, and that is risk-reducing mastectomy, in other words, chop away the breast, or chemo prevention, in other words, giving anti-hormones to get a woman into her menopause. Both are actually also used to treat cancer, actually, or a maximum invasive treatment of cancer. And as such, are only, say, a choice in women who have a very high lifetime risk of breast cancer. For instance, BRCA1 mutation carriers. But there's certainly no option for the average woman. So primary prevention is not attainable, and we're left with secondary prevention. 
screening to ensure early diagnosis to avoid harm due to breast cancer. And we know that screening should work because we know that there is a huge survival difference depending on the stage of breast cancer at the time of diagnosis. If cancer is diagnosed while it is still um, localized to the breast, then survival is almost 100%, even over extended periods of time. But once there is metastases, survival is poor. So finding breast cancer before it metastasizes or before clonal diversification occurs is the aim of secondary prevention. So what are the options for early diagnosis? Well, one is liquid biopsy, <laughs> you may have heard of, and mammography or non-mammographic methods for screening. I'd like to start with liquid biopsy because I've heard people saying, well, liquid biopsy is going to push radiologists out of business because it will take over all the diagnostic tasks that are so far fulfilled by radiologists. Look at biopsy has the following principle. A tumor will always shed some tumor cells, but also only tumor DNA into the bloodstream, which can then be detected by sensitive methods, either circulating tumor cells or only circulating tumor DNA or even only RNA, or even only part of it, like exosomes, exosomes. If you use sufficiently sensitive methods that always involve PCR, you would be able to find these traces in the human blood. How useful is this for breast cancer diagnosis? This paper investigates the utility of Circulating Tumor Cells, published in 2013. It's one of the largest papers published on this issue on 2,026 patients with known breast cancer, stage one to three. Circulating tumor cells were found in 21.5%. And the actual aim here was to find out whether this would predict survival. And this is the survival analysis. Indeed, there was a subtle survival difference between women who did have detectable circulating tumor cells as opposed to those who did not. But this difference disappeared when, for an analysis of overall survival. But there, is, there seems to be some uh, prognostic information here. This meta-analysis published last year found that in patients with breast cancer, circulating tumor cells are detectable in about 23% of the cases. And this is useful to improve the prognostic ability of prognostic models that are used to guide treatment decisions regarding the need or no need of systemic treatment. In other words, a sensitivity of 23% is clearly not enough to be used or considered a diagnostic test, although it is frequently called like when. Circulating tumor cells can be used as prognostic markers, not as a diagnostic test. There are more methods coming up, I think every second year or so, if you delve into this subject. This paper was published in 2013 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it's somehow paradigmatic for many other papers that have been published on liquid biopsy. It's paradigmatic because of the number of patients involved. In this trial, published in a major journal that is actually not known for its experimental side, um, it was an analysis on 30 women who had circulating tumor DNA observed. Similarly, a review in 2017 cites many successful papers that dealt with the use of uh, circulating cell-free DNA for diagnostic purposes and gives this example, for instance, as an indicator of tumor stage, an author enrolled 38 patients with breast cancer, two patients with non-cancerous breast lesions, nine patients after surgery, 16 healthy participants, and 29 control women. Not exactly a large cohort. Cohort is also a key word here. In 2019, a new, public, a new method for um, 
um, mutal, uh, mutated cells diagnosed in liquid biopsies on four different cohorts where the cohort size ranged between five patients and 12 patients. This paper published in Science in the year 2019 comes across with still another method called cancer seek, somehow suggestive terminology, and found that the sensitivity, the median sensitivity to find these circulating tumor components was 70% and ranged from 98% in ovarian cancer, likely patients with huge tumor load, down to 33% in breast cancer, in other words, in women with low tumor volume. This um, review was published this year and said that since circulating tumor cells and circulating tumor components directly correlate with disease volume, so to speak, there are not necessarily the best tool to be used for early diagnosis. And then they add that in addition to this sensitivity aspect, there's a specificity problem because mutated circulating cells can also be just a matter of normal aging, not necessarily indicative of a cancer to be present. So there's also a specificity problem. In other words, a problem of overdiagnosis and false positive results. So it seems to be somewhat oversold, this technology. Um, and sold is also a nice keyword because when I entered this yesterday evening in Google, this is what Google provided as a, a search result, the first three hits. So it seems to be a, um, say, competitive field, liquid biopsy. But I think it's when, I wouldn't say it is nonsense. I wouldn't say it, uh, it, you shouldn't look into this or you shouldn't take this serious. What I think is that we as radiologists should um, proactively um, talk to people who work in this field. And I think this is important for many reasons. One is also exemplified by this statement here, which is taken from one of the recent paper published also in a high-ranking journal, where I think an appalling absence of knowledge about practical clinical um, work is obvious when the authors say, current methods for detection and evaluation of cancer include computer tomography scans and surgical biopsies. So if it's not a good biopsy, then it's still imaging for secondary prevention of breast cancer for the time being. We know that screening for breast cancer is useful. We know this from the trials from the 1970s uh, when a couple of randomized controlled prospective clinical trial have been done that all documented that there is a mortality reducing effect of screening mammography. And uh, the analysis of this data still continues in recent times. This paper was just published in Cancer that looked at the incidence of fatal breast cancer in women who participated in mammographic screening as opposed to those who didn't, and found the 60% lower risk of dying from cancer within 10 years after diagnosis, and still almost 50% lower risk 20 years after diagnosis. And the authors conclude that women who have participated in screening mammography obtain a significantly greater benefit from treatment. That is the effect of the fact that we find cancer before it gets difficult to treat due to metastasize or clonal diversification. And still, mammographic screening is controversial to say the very least. It is always in the press. What is the problem? How come this uh, bashing of mammography for screening? Well, the problem is that screening per se is inherently ineffective. Screening means to zeef. So we walk through a large amount of women to find a few diseased individuals. For breast cancer, it's four to five per thousand screenees. So a maximum of five. Of thousand. So you need to f 
work through a lot of healthy individuals to find a few diseased women, thousands of normal individuals to find a few that exhibit the disease, and only those can expect a benefit. In addition, the problem is, however, that even the ones who actually can have a bet or will have a benefit is even lower than that. And the reason is one overdiagnosis. Not all cancers that we detect should be found. What do we mean with we don't need to find all cancers? Well, there are cancers which, even if left undiagnosed and therefore also left untreated, will never progress to a life-threatening disease. They will remain clinically asymptomatic. It's a true positive diagnosis of cancer, but one that a cancer or a disease that is self-limiting, not progressing even without treatment. In other words, overdiagnosis is diagnosis of cancers that don't behave like cancers. How do we know? Well, we know because when we observe cancer incidence rates over time, then what we see is that with the start of mammographic screening, there's a steep jump of cancer detection. Many more cancers are being diagnosed since we screen for them with mammographic, uh, uh, with mammographic screening programs. However, we haven't seen a concomitant decrease of late stage disease. So we have an excess rate of extra cancers that are likely due to overdiagnosis. These are cancers which, if we hadn't done a mammogram, wouldn't be known by the woman. What is the reason for overdiagnosis? Well, the reason is that there are indeed cancers that behave like benign changes. Breast cancer is a heterogeneous group of disease. You may know that we distinguish it in four different large categories or bins. Um, but, um, of course, the biologic continuum is very wide. What is less known is that a cancer's genotype will also determine its imaging phenotype. We know that the typical cancers that we search for with mammographic screening are typically luminal A disease. Luminal A disease has the phenotype with the speculated margins or calcifications that we usually search for when we use mammography for screening. Whereas the aggressive tumors, the triple negative tumors, can have roundish shapes um, and smooth margins. So they look deceivingly like a benign um, tumor. So the problem is that if we use mammography for screening, the detection of cancer in mammography will always be biased towards slowly growing tumors because what we depict or architectural distortions or speculated lesions that are due to slowly growing tumors or they reflect pathophysiological changes that are indicative of regressive slowed growth. Which is why our detection is always biased towards slowly growing cancers when we use mammography for screening. So the problem will be that out of the five individuals for whom we find breast cancer through mammographic screening, one will actually not benefit from this, from this uh, diagnosis, but will be overdiagnosed. Overdiagnosis is still not our main problem. Overdiagnosis does no direct harm. The harm is actually overtreatment. We can characterize the biologic or prognostic importance of cancers by routine laboratory tests, and we do so in every single case. We can inform women about the lack of significance of a cancer or pseudo-cancer in her individual case to avoid anxieties, and we can tailor treatment according to the prognostic significance or lack thereof as determined by the routine laboratory tests. So it's not over-detection that's a problem, it's over-treatment. Adverse effects of overdetection can be avoided or alleviated by adequate patient information and adequate patient management. Overdiagnosis is one problem. The actual problem is underdiagnosis of breast cancer. Between 20 and 40% of all cancers that are 
um, found in women who do participate in screening will not be picked up by the screening test, but will pop up in between screening round as so-called interval cancers. And these interval cancers have a significantly worse prognosis than the mammography visible, the screen detected cancers. So at least two additional women will not benefit from screening mammography because their cancer will be found in between screening rounds due to palpable lumps, for instance. This is an, indeed a significant problem. Late diagnosis of cancer who participate in screening mammography and the diagnosis of cancer and interval cancers are the main driver of breast cancer mortality. The reason for underdiagnosis are twofold. One is host-related, dense tissue can obscure cancers, but then also tumor-related, and that is the exact phenotype of rapidly growing cancers that are in an exact mimic of benign tumors or even cysts on mammography. You can't distinguish them. And the third reason that explains why not everybody who could benefit, will benefit is false alarm that adds to the burden of women who are actually healthy. False alarm means not every suspicious finding, of course, does re um, correspond to cancer. However, these false positive diagnoses will be settled by a very simple, minimally invasive um, needle biopsy. Nobody is treated because a cancer is presumably present. For every woman with a true positive diagnosis of cancer, there will be three to four women who undergo this procedure. And that will add to the downside of screening. So this is the exact problem. We have like four out of 1,000 women who can benefit from screening mammography, but many more who may have no benefit or even side effects. And this relation is the reason why mammographic screening is on the debate. To an extent that there are even suggestions to abolish screening mammography as a whole, which is certainly um, um, uh, not a useful way to proceed because that would then mean that we don't do anything about early diagnosis of breast cancer anymore. The actual mistake is something else. The selection criteria to include women in mammographic screening programs are politically completely incorrect, sex and age. We, need, we will include everyone who is a woman, not men, and who is between 50 and 70 years of age. These are the only inclusion criteria for screening mammography. That explains why we need to screen huge amounts of women to find a few diseased ones. Now, what would be a much smarter way to proceed is to enrich the screening cohort by identifying the ones who are more likely to get the disease, like through this procedure, and clearly include the ones that have cancer, and then concentrate on to screening this much smaller group of women, which is then risk-adjusted, personalized screening. What we need to do this is predictive measures. We need tools that help us find or identify the ones who are more likely to develop the disease. One way to do so is to select women with a higher amount of fibroglandular tissue, like dense breasts, in other words. This is what um, the breast density spectrum, so to speak, um, from ACR1, which is entirely dense to extremely dense. There are four categories so far that are being assigned. Dense breast is considered everything that is heterogeneously dense or extremely dense. Right now, there is, it is, has become federal law to inform women about their breast densities and recommend them to undergo supplemental non-mammographic screening to compensate for the weaknesses the masking effect of dense breast tissue. But also because um, it has been shown that dense breast tissue is a risk factor on its own that increases the risk to develop subsequent breast cancer. 
problem here is that this includes half of the population because half of the population will have dense breast tissue. This is also shown in this graph. This shows the distribution of breast densities over a wide range of time. And as you see, that's always half of the population. How specific can a recommendation be when it includes half the population? And how credible is it that half the population is now at risk to develop, to develop breast cancer? This is likely not a useful way to proceed. So it's not breast density. What else we can do is use detailed risk assessment scores. These are the Tyra Kuzik scores, the breast cancer surveillance scores, and so forth. They involve that women are interviewed and give all their detailed information on age, family history, personal history, and so forth. The Tyra Kuzik score, uh, version one to seven, included only this personal information. The new version also includes breast density. The predictive accuracy, the accuracy with which the result actually um, uh, foretells that a woman will develop breast cancer is fairly high with 0.63 under the, under, as an area under the curve for the Tyra Kuzik model eight. Sounds good, but the problem with the Tyra Kuzik model is that it is extremely time consuming to collect this data, and there's a lot of data that people won't necessarily know about whether they have atip years, when exactly was the aminarchy or menopause, or what family members had breast cancer, what age, and so. Um, this paper is one written by nurse practitioners who says that using risk calculating models, such as the Tarakusic model, is time intensive and that it often necessitates more than one office visit by a woman and it would not be feasible to calculate the Tarakusic score for every patient. So, a predictive measure that is not doable on a broader scale is certainly not very helpful. Genomic features can also be used for risk prediction. Um, they usually involve taking a buccal swab, saliva, to then determine what people call single nucleotide polymorphisms. As opposed to the single mutations that are a very important driver of breast cancer risk, like BRCA1 or BRCA2 or CHECK2, Single nucleotide polymorphisms are just point mutations that usually don't uh, inactivate a gene, but they modulate the function to some degree. They are uh, determin determinable through genome-wide association studies. Genome-wide association means that the entire genome is um, uh, investigated to search for these polymorphisms, and then people compare the spectrum of polymorphisms that they see in individuals with a certain disease as opposed to individuals who lack the disease. And from this difference, they then identify SNPs that are associated with a specific disease like breast cancer, for instance. This has been published earlier this year on polygenic risk scores, in other words, SNPs, identified through these genome-wide association studies. The accuracy of predicting subsequent breast cancer is listed here in this column, and I just uh, highlight this here, compared with the um, ways, the um, established ways to describe women's risk through, for instance, the Tyra Cusick score, the SNPs are equivalent. They have the same prognostic or say pred sorry, pre predictive information. Now, I said that you know breast density is a feature that somehow is associated with a woman's woman's lifetime risk to develop breast cancer. Um, but it is, of course, a biologic continuum, and the question that we should ask ourselves is why would we at all want to categorize a biologic continuum? This question has also been asked by Connie Lehman, Chief of Breast Imaging at MGH, and um, Regina Basilai. She is a professor for artificial intelligence at MIT. 
both joined forces to do a huge analysis on the predictive power of deep learning of regular mammograms. They thought, and I agree, that the texture of mammograms, not only the density, but the texture of mammograms, are almost like a fingerprint, quite specific for a given individual. So what they did is they used an incredible amount of high quality data, over 70,000 um, mammograms, to feed a deep learning algorithm. The training set was fed not only with the mammograms, but also with high quality outcome information on the, um, um, on the fact whether or not the given individual did develop and what type and what stage of breast cancer five years down the line. For the testing set, they excluded all women who's, uh, who had developed um, breast cancer within one year after the respective last mammogram in order to avoid improved early diagnosis of breast cancer to factor in, but just to test the predictive power of this type of deep learning algorithm. And what they found is that with only their deep learning, no information whatsoever given, neither on age, nor on prior biopsies, nor on family history, or personal history details, or hormone intake, um, they had a predictive accuracy which was far above what was obtainable through SNPs, or quite exen extensive, comprehensive um, questionnaires. And if they add um, usual risk factors that should be known to women and add this to the score, it has an extra increase. This is amazing and quite encouraging. It was published in Radiology this month, and it means that we have now at our fingertips the means that we need to guide personalized screening recommendations. More importantly, they also found that their deep learning analysis is um, superior to the Tyra Kuzik analysis, specifically uh, also across races. The Tyra Kuzik was validated only in Caucasian women. So it performs poorly in African-American women. That's not the case for the deep learning algorithm who can cope with this or regarding pre versus postmenopausal women, or regarding women with versus without family history. So that's fantastic and stable. Of course, this is an MRI conference, and uh, I'd like to mention here at this point that specifically MRI adds also pred predictive information just by analysis of the enhancement of the normal fibroglandular tissue. We categorize also the tissue on MRI according to density, so to speak, in other words, to the degree of background enhancement. And it's fairly well established that this is also indicative of an increased risk for subsequent breast cancer. This has recently been validated through a large clinical trial involving over 4,000 healthy individuals, healthy at the time of recruitment, who underwent MRI for screening, had their parenchymal background enhancement categorized on the four-point scale, and where then it was observed whether they would or would not develop breast cancer down the line. And authors found that um, parenchymal background enhancement is associated with future risk, with risk of future breast cancer to a degree that is even higher than the respective woman's risk or predictive information on the bio -reds category of the mammographic density. Of course, this was also pursued by our dream team, Connie Lehman and uh, Regina Basilai. They looked at um, breast MRI screening, only very few actually data in terms of deep learning algorithm, of course, and found that not with 70,000 in this case, but with only just 1,400 studies, they already achieve a predictive power which is well beyond the predictive power of SNPs. 
and it certainly will be complementary to use MRI background enhancement and texture analysis. And on top of this, of course, MRI also provides texture information. We so far used only the background information, background enhancement information, but of course, MRI also tells you something about density, architecture, you just have to exploit this information. So we live in the golden age, I think, of deep learning and imaging-based risk prediction. We can use information that we have and generate imaging biomarkers that are predictive and that help us make recommendations for our patients. Why not using liver MRI text analyses to predict, just predict, who is going to develop HCC? If something, uh, back my, um, I mean, boring, <laughs> simple, as mammographic density and texture provide such detailed predictive information, what would you expect to happen if we use the full range of multi-parametric MRI information for this purpose. That will work, so go for it. Liver MRI, prostate MRI, I don't mean the prostate cancer and radiomics of the prostate cancer to predict its natural behavior. I mean an analysis of the prostate to find out who is going to develop prostate cancer. Or maybe just CT, who is going to develop Maybe not lung cancer, because we have enough predictive information for these patients, but lung uh, disease in general. So go for it, and everywhere where we have enough data to feed deep learning algorithms, I think will be useful to make uh, improved risk predictions. So once we have the prediction, the prediction, we should act. We know about prediction. We know about the heterogeneity of cancer. We know about overdiagnosis, underdiagnosis. We know about the limitations of mammography, and we have developed non mammographic imaging. How is this used today in clinical practice? How do we use this information? Well, with these predictive measures, we can very, um, we can have a, a, a far reaching detailed risk assessment. So what we do then is in women at low risk, we do an annual mammogram. In women at average risk, we do an annual mammogram. In women at increased risk, we do an annual mammogram. And in high risk women, that's like less than 3% or less of the, um, of the population, we do annual MRI in addition to an annual mammogram, of course. And uh, that is for clinical practice. What about research? Same thing. The uh, WISDOM trial stands for women informed to screen depending on measures of risk. We'll do such in-depth risk analysis and pre use predictive markers to categorize risk. But it's still a mammogram. And the only modulation there is age of onset of the mammogram and intervals of the mammographic screening. An alternate way to proceed would be to exploit the predictive, also imaging biomarkers that we have, or marry the different predictive markers, the tissue biomarkers, maybe the SNPs, plus imaging biomarkers to do a, a detailed risk prediction. Find out who needs and what type, how much of screening. Then use imaging method that offer a sensitivity profile that we want to have, in other words, a high sensitivity for biologically significant disease and a low sensitivity for insignificant changes, pseudo disease, which is exactly actually what MRI offers because what we depict when we use MRI for screening is its depiction of antigenic and protease activity, in other words, tissue alterations that directly correlate with carcinogenesis, with cell proliferation, and with metastatic activity. In other words, the MRI detection of breast cancer and DCIS is biased towards biologically active, prognostically important disease. 
which is the exact opposite of what mammography does. So these type of cancers will be visible on MRI with very high reliability. This has also been de uh, described by Janice Sung from the Sloan Kettering Group. She has shown that the sensitivity of MRI increases in an order of increasing biologic importance of disease, whereas that of mammography decreases. We need this type of biological profile. We know that MRI outperforms mammography and ultrasound for screening. We know that this is true for a wide range of risk profiles. The DENSE trial that's going to be published hopefully soon, pursued by, the, um, Dutch, uh, by a, a Dutch group, selectively used MRI, full protocol MRI, in the small gr group of women with extremely dense breast. This is risk-adjusted screening um, put to practice. They found in women who had extremely dense breast an additional cancer detection rate through MRI of 16.5 per thousand, which is in the range of expected value. But what they found also is that with MRI, the interval cancer rate was five-fold lower compared with mammographic screening from five over five per thousand down to under one per thousand interval cancers. This is a landmark, this is a quantum leap. This will greatly improve success of screening and reduce breast cancer mortality. So instead of this, we want to do this. With abbreviated MRI, we have the hope that we can expand the um, use of MRI to be less restrictive and include women at only intermediate risk as well. We know that abbreviated MRI works because it has been practiced in over 30, 18 different um, single and multi center trials over a substantial number of women and breast cancers. We know that abbreviated MRI yields the same diagnostic information, the same cancer detection rate as does full protocol MRI certainly at lower cost and improved patient tolerability. Which is why ACOG Akron sponsored a trial that compares the cancer detection rate of abbreviated MRI with breast tomothensis under the lead of Christopher Comstock and together with Gillian Newstead. This paper um, has been submitted and will be published soon and will confirm that this is a viable solution for women with dense breast tissue. So we should use risk-adapted screening protocols to adapt our screening efforts to the individual woman's lifetime risk to develop breast cancer, but also exploit the portfolio of imaging methods that we have. Don't stick to the same toy that we always used for screening. So instead of this, we could end up doing this. No mammogram, no screening for women who have an explicitly low risk, maybe mammography for women at average risk, biannual abbreviated MRI, and then annual MRI for high-risk women only. Predict Then Act is actually an editorial that I um, wrote um, that accompanied the paper on using background parenchymal enhancement for risk prediction in women undergoing MRI for screening. And that is my closing word. Preventive measures should be adapted to the specific needs of an individual. We now have the predictive measures. And we as radiologists, we will contribute to improved risk prediction through imaging biomarkers that we provide. And we have the tools to meet this need. Let us begin to tailor our preventive efforts accordingly. Thank you very much. Dr. Cool, outstanding. Thank you very much for your presentation. We have a small token of appreciation. Okay. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you.
All right, well that concludes the academic portion of the meeting. So we have a closing party to get to, and it'll be starting in just a few minutes downstairs. Thank you all for coming again, and it's been a great year in Montreal.